it's so good to have you. Um, I was just being told about this backstage because I know you're really into sustainability. Yes. It's one of your hot topics with top tier impact, That's which right. you are the founder of. I want to make sure your mic is working. Say something to them, please. Hi, guys. Hi, everybody. I, can you hear her? Lovely. Fantastic. Okay. So this is a gift to all the speakers, and you're the first one officially to get it on stage. And we're giving this to everybody. It's a gift from the crew here. Um, completely sustainable, from Estonia, a straw and a cleaner, plus as a donation Amazing. for every speaker. I think we have about 155 speakers. Every speaker's donation going to what's going on in Ukraine. So you're the official first person to receive this. Yay! Thank you. <laughs> thank you, guys. And thank you to the wonderful team that has been doing so much good work so far. Absolutely. Alessa, there's so much we can talk about when it comes to yes. you, and you've got this panel to do right now. Yes. So of the different things, um, let's start with this one. Where are you from? That is a very good question that has a long answer, actually. I am Swiss-Brazilian, and I grew up in the Italian part of Switzerland. When you go to Italy, you're Swiss. When you go to the rest of Switzerland, you're Italian. So this global citizen thing uh -huh. has been here from the very early days of my existence. Fantastic. Now, I know there's a lot of reasons why people will want to come and talk to Alessa. So whether it's this topic or the topic of impact and sustainability, please do stop her. I was on your website and I love your definition of impact. I think it's some sense like sustainable, equal and joyous. Right. That yes. is your definition of what impact is. Yes. So if you're curious about any of that, please catch her. She's around all day. But right now she's got two fantastic panelists to bring up on stage. So with no further ado, Alessa, the stage is yours and let's welcome up the panelists. All right, dashing woman on this panel. I am so excited. And this is a topic that, as we were just saying with Dan, like sits like right in my heart, in my mind, everywhere. But we don't get to talk about it so much because it feels like it's part of our lifestyle somehow. It's part of the lifestyle of my team and a lot of the people at Top Tier Impact. So I'm very excited to cover this topic today with two incredible women who, quite frankly, have been pioneering not only remote work and what it means to be global citizen, but also what it means to be highly successful women entrepreneurs. And so I will let you introduce Introduce yourself first and then dive into the panel, yeah. please. Hey, uh, my name is Sarah. I'm uh, the co-founder and CTO of a company called Safety Wing. Um, if you know us, you probably know us for insurance for digital nomads because that's the first product we launched. But since day one, our goal has been to build a global social safety net. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about what that is tomorrow in my, in my talk. Um, but um, yeah, we launched in 2017 and uh, just raised our Series B. Uh, and we're working for a borderless future. Thank you so much, Sarah. Catherine, please. Yes. Hello, Tallinn. Uh, first of all, I'm Karali, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Jobatical. So what we do is basically we are removing the friction of labor mobility. In human words, what it means is that my team is work, working towards the world where in order to move a person from one country to another, no trees should be taken down. But before we go to, um, uh, to our discussion and digital nomads and future work, I must I will take a step back because I'm the only Estonian on this panel. <laughs> and uh, just yesterday I was speaking in front of some media, uh, international media, and it, it, it reminded me how extremely proud I am to where we have gotten as an ecosystem. Because I started as a 16 year old entrepreneur when it was a post Soviet dark grayish country and just sitting here talking about what we are talking looking at the numbers i don't estonian startup ecosystem did with the first quarter this year almost as much funding investments as the whole year last year so this ecosystem is booming we're talking about the future we are being the future i just wanted to acknowledge how this being interconnected with the world and i think this is very much uh, what we are talking about as well how this can actually have a positive impact into societies so with that i just i will do one thing that is very risky in estonia and i've been a ceo of mtv so i know that you Expecting that people will share with you in Estonia is very little, but let's make some noise, Tallinn! <laughs> 
So, thank you. But Amazing. Thank you, Caroline. <laughs> dashing start here. In fact, now that you guys are warming up, one more question. Who here sitting in the audience feels like a global citizen? Raise your hands. Yay, most of the audience, amazing. All right, well, let's start with that, actually. Caroline, what does it mean to you to be a global citizen? And here I will take another step back and look what it means to be a citizen. And I think that is one of the systems that is broken today. So if you think about passport, and by the way, do you know when passports really became into use? It was after the First World War. Countries started to use it after the First World War, and the whole system was created by Western-centric organization. So it was biased, basically protecting the Western countries, and the system from its core was biased, not really protecting the rest of the world. And we are still, I mean, First World War was a century ago. I mean, if you look at the cars that we had back then and the cars we have now, there's a huge development. But if you look at our passport, it hasn't changed. So I think one of the big things that needs innovation is the whole concept of a passport. And I don't mean about identity. I think we all want to belong. We need to belong. It's important to belong and to value the culture. But passport is just a statistical error. You were accidentally born in one place and I was accidentally born in another place. And that cannot define the way I'm moving cross borders. So I think uh, if you, to answer your question, what it means to be a global citizen is that we are interconnected. And I think the system that enables us to move across borders should reflect that, but it is not mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Caroline. Sarah, what is your definition of what it means to be a global citizen? Yeah, so uh, just to mention a little bit about how I feel as a global citizen. Um, I was born in Norway. I didn't move from Norway until I was 27, but even before that, I always saw myself as someone who was going to move abroad, as I you know, thought of it then. Um, and I uh, moved to London. I live in the US now, primarily. Um, I have a dual citizenship, which already kind of, what is this thing? I mean, do I, does that mean I have two identities? I mean, was I born in two places? No, I was born in Norway. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, the, the role of the passport is changing. We're working on, on creating a, a passport. We're currently working on making digital nomad visas um, and uh, want to eventually create a, a passport. We're working on a, a country called Plumia, if, if you've heard of it. Um, and uh, yeah, what does it mean? I mean, since uh, th there's been a big change happening over the last 30 years with you know the, the internet coming, and I think um, uh, back when I was a kid, like most of my friends were frankly international. I mean, they were in many different places around the world because my friends were on the internet. Uh, and I think much thanks to the, the internet, it's it's such a huge number of people that now feel that their primary culture and their primary home and their the people that they're the most connected to are anywhere in the world. And, and with remote work, you can take it a step further and have your job also, you know, which is significant. It's a third of your life and in, in your uh, in your active years, uh, where you can you can spend that uh, with anyone in the world wherever. And I think um, um, I truly feel like a global citizen. And I think um, so will most people over time. Uh, you, you start to get this feeling about how arbitrary borders are. Um, another example of how arbitrary borders are that isn't personal is um, my company, have we have people from about 60 different countries. Uh, we often meet up uh, somewhere in the world and there's always a few people that can't make it because of visas mm. uh, and because of their citizenship, which that, that just really makes it feel completely arbitrary because there's no difference in you know, what they are going to do when they arrive in that country and what the rest of us that have good passports are, able, are going to do when we're in that country. Um, so, uh, yeah, Carolyn, did you have... Yeah, Carolina, well, you have just I would like to expand on that because mm -hmm. it's a very good point because this is my passion. Our passion, yeah. that's what we're trying to solve, is to really make the whole visa uh, process uh, seamless and, and not being biased, right? But what is symbolic here, you mentioned the Digital Nomad visa uh, and actually it was around 700 meters from this spot in our office where we started to create the world's first Digital Nomad visa. Yeah. And why was that exactly the same? 
same thought process that you ha had, that uh, what we saw was that in order to get a person to your country, uh, to a country, you either, they, they enter as a tourist, and they are not allowed to work as a tourist, or they have to have an employer. And yet you have millions of people who work in a way that they don't need to have an employer in that country, but there's no policy to support that. Mm. So with the Estonian government, we managed to make it happen, and now you see other mm -hmm. countries are following. But the, I think our topic is future of work. The reality is this is not future, it's present. Mm -hmm. It's here. Yes, it's here right now. And so before we dive straight into the future and also talk about, I mean, the incredible acceleration of the last couple of years through COVID, on a personal note, the start of your journey, right, to, to do this, like currently your company is pioneering uh, and enabling people actually all across Europe, soon all around the world, uh, to live this lifestyle, right, and to like live uh, this global citizen uh, definition to the core of how their day-to-day -day works like how did your journey start oh that's a very good question the journey started actually um, uh, I was in Singularity University which is a very cool think tank in uh, Mountain View and living in NASA Ames for that think tank summer and I'm a runner so I used to run to the seaside every morning I passed Google and I it started basically I started to ask why are the Googles of the world here what's up with this place that suddenly you have all those amazing companies that change industries coming from this one area. And I looked into it and I realized it's not actually the people who are born there are smarter, it's that smart people move there. <laughs> so I started to dig into how could we inspire those smart people who are circling to uh, the globe to come to Silicon Valley to discover places like Tallinn or Helsinki or Amsterdam. So we actually started as a cross-border hiring platform. This inspiring go and work in Penang Island, Malaysia. By doing that, what we learned through our clients was that their biggest problem was not hiring, it was actually getting those hired people in. Mm -hmm. So we pivoted uh, very successfully in 2019 and started to solve the biggest problem of labor mobility, which is basically the whole hideous immigration relocation process. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Carolyn. It's funny, I have a similar Silicon Valley story of arriving there and finally feeling like I'm a good fit. So, on that note, Sarah, what is your story of how you got started? I also went to Silicon Valley. <laughs> Um, in, uh, in Norway, maybe you have something similar in Estonia, I don't know, but in Norway we have this cross-university program called Norwegian School of Entrepreneurship. I attended this back in 2012. I always knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur, uh, more based on like my own personality type and you know, I knew I wanted to create something and I think that was best suited for my personality. I was studying computer science at the time and then I attended this program, which is like a master's level program in San Francisco where you intern at a startup. I interned at Fastly, a company that IPO'd two years ago um, when they were 15 people. And just being in Silicon Valley and feeling this this vibe of uh, just you can, you know, there's, there's no ceiling um, and uh, you, your ambitions cannot possibly be too high. Uh, that, is, that is just the general feeling in Silicon Valley that just puts my ambitions very high. Uh, I kept going with, you know, my computer science direction. I'm, I mean, I am the CTO now after all, so, uh, but, but I decided to go into, you know, specifically tech startups, uh, went through that route. Uh, in this program in San Francisco, I also met my co-founder, so that, that's a significant part because he went on to start a freelancer platform. Uh, I went like a technical startup route, I was the lead engineer of a startup uh, in London, and we just kept talking about this. We, we'd both moved abroad, uh, I became a nomad, and we just kept this conversation going about being international and uh, started talking about, you know, there should be a global social safety net because that's, that's what we'd grown up with, a great uh, local social safety net that was really good. And we were like, I'd, I'd pay for that. That's a, you know, the Norwegian social safety net is a good product. Uh, so why is that connected to a country? Um, and uh, uh, eventually, you know, those thoughts just that, that need became so pressing, we kept running into the topic. It was just meant to be, um, he was trying to buy insurance for and benefits for all the freelancers on his platform, couldn't find it, does not exist. We tried to make other people build it, like, well, we were doing other things, and then eventually it was just, uh, okay, no, we have to build this. 
Fantastic. And All right. Well, it looks like there is something in common here. And I have to say that since arriving at the airport in Tallinn, I have been feeling a really good vibe. I can't quite describe it yet, but it was the best airport that I've been to. I've been to a lot of airports and I've had a lot of awful experiences as well, but this was fantastic. So, so far, I am definitely noticing a special vibe in this city. Now, before we actually focus on just like all the things about the future, let's still stay a little bit with the roots, but the roots of the movement, right? The future of work, like to understand the future, thinking about just pre-COVID. What was happening pre-COVID, right? Because it's easy to say, oh, well, COVID has accelerated everything now, right? Remote is going mainstream. I like to say I was an early adopter of remote uh, pre-COVID and, uh, you know, it's helped me hire uh, people in a smoother way than ever before because our team is all around the world and we have started forming offices over time, but really like remote is at our core of the lifestyle of uh, our employees. And so let's think about what was happening just before COVID hit and took all of this to the next level. What were you noticing as like the trends and the changes that had been building up until 2020, Sarah? Um, so up until 2020, we started out as a fully remote company. We started in 2017. I was sitting in New York, my co-founder and my, one of my co-founders in San Francisco, another one in, in Norway, and our, we had an engineer in Canada. Um, so we started out fully remote and that wasn't, that wasn't like a conscious decision. Like, should we be remote or not? It was just like, like just the default for us. And we, we just kind of had this like underlying knowledge that this, this is how you're supposed to be working. Um, and, uh, but I do remember as we were fundraising and, and you know, this is just, this isn't a long time ago, it's five years ago, but we were a little bit more, we kind of glossed over the fact that we were a remote company um, because you were kind of expected to, you know, if you were a serious company to have an office in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And uh, that's definitely changed a lot. Uh, we knew that remote work was going to be the biggest thing in the world. Um, I mean, I, I just think, you know, we've gone through these shifts with the internet um, where, you know, my generation, uh, we, we grew up with, you know, anything is searchable. You can find out any information. You know, the library is, you know, it's, it's no longer, you don't have to go to the library if you want to know something. Yeah. Uh, it's at your fingertips. And then, you know, the Gen Z, is, grew, Gen Z grew up with social media, which is kind of the second wave, changed the world, like made, made us more connected. But remote work is the big one. You know, remote work is the one that's truly going to unify us and, you know, it's big, like, equalizer across borders. Um, and um, uh, that's, that's where we are today. And, like, thanks to COVID, this was just just hit us in the face much faster and a yeah. lot of people were suddenly aware. Um, yeah, it's just been an insane change uh, see, seeing how companies that had no plans of going remote now are remote because, oh yeah, we hired a bunch of people or everyone just moved away and now we are remote, I guess. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. totally. Pre-COVID, post-COVID, Carolyn, what was the pre-COVID ramp up like for you? Yeah, I think a few things. First of all, as a company, I think for us, similarly, we were hybrid before, uh, we are hybrid now, like the change didn't really, so working in Jabatical was quite the same before and after COVID. But uh, what we, I mean, definitely the trends that uh, we were seeing, I was seeing, were, were very connected to talent shortage. I Like, why this, like, a mer like rise of flexibility is happening is because talents can demand f flexibility. So before, already before COVID, it was clear that the countries are in trouble. Like, everybody's fighting for the same people. In order to uh, get those people, you have to please those people. So more and more countries started to ask, so how do we get those people in? What do we need to change? But I think now one of the things definitely when we think about before COVID and uh, after COVID, so uh, when the, I remember, I think it was already in 2015 when the Nomad List founder uh, predicted that by 2035 there will be one billion digital nomads. And I used that on my slides, but I've done that too. <laughs> yeah. And then I said, but I, I actually don't know how we will get there. Like, but it's a nice number, right? Mm -hmm. But I, I think what I started to see post-COVID is now suddenly what happened was that both the employers saw that people can work remotely and the, uh, also the employees saw that they can work remotely. And now what happened is that you had those two years where people uh, sat with all their travel dreams inside those tiny apartments 
and now all those streams can basically be released. So uh, I think what, what, we, what we're seeing now is that more and more employers just literally, in order to retain, to recruit, uh, they are saying, you know, want to work here, want to move there, we will take care of you. Mm -hmm. So um, this, and this has been a very fast shift now post-COVID. Absolutely. And maybe let's also look at some of the hard facts and numbers of how much this growth has accelerated. Any punchy stats to share about that? Do you have? Do you want to start? <sighs> so I think right now in terms of numbers, uh, it is too early after COVID. So mm -hmm. what we are seeing is that, I mean, when we talk about uh, movement in general, so annually there's approximately 272 million relocations. Mm -hmm. And this is before digital nomads. So the movement was insane even before digital mm -hmm. nomads. In terms of stats, then it's too early for us because we, the, it has just ended. So I think we can talk, sit here next year, probably we have more information about what the shift post-COVID has been. But just for you to understand the movement, then the movement of people has doubled in the last 20 years, tripled in the last 40 years. So, and every year, every 30th person moves to another country mm -hmm. to live. So this is kind of like to get the picture. So how many people we have here? Quite a few of uh, you will, or us will be moving somewhere. How many people have relocated in the last five years in the audience? Pretty interesting, quite a few of us. <laughs> All right, so we are ready to finally talk about the future and let's start feeling this future. So maybe some of the technologies, right, that are coming. Um, Carolee, can you talk about one or two technologies that you're particularly excited about mm -hmm. and that are gonna enable us to live this future? Absolutely. So. Again, I actually got goosebumps because this is, uh, I love this topic. I got goosebumps too, actually. <laughs> so I, I think in our field, and like I'm truly, truly uh, passionate about what we are building because we know it just will help so many people. But what, what we are seeing, I think, in terms of uh, governments, uh, is where you talked about visa and how, how your colleagues didn't get in. I think where we are in terms of uh, immigration systems and processes uh, for, from the uh, public sector side, it's kind of the place where last century there was a place where uh, all public sector was using typewriters. You know, there was those things you type and take a paper. And then they started to understand that they, ha they have to move to desktop computers. It was a scary thought because typing something, having the paper physically there, touching it, putting it in, it seemed much safer. So this is, but yet we all move to emails, office, and so much more efficient. So I think where we are in terms of uh, technologies that from the pub public sector side is kind of this is starting to happen. So countries, I mean, we are, I'm being invited to talk about how to digitalize the immigration and systems. So we see that there's this, we need to change. We need to make this process more efficient. So I predict that this, in the next two years, uh, there, are, there will be the first countries who will fully digitalize the process. Mm -hmm. So you don't need to go to an embassy with a paper and then at the other office to, with a paper and somebody typing in. That this change is right now starting to happen. And, and imagine wh whoever, like you, there are a lot of people had to move to a, a country. So you have seen how many papers are printed in order for you to uh, actually make that move. So. Through that, we will also protect our planet quite significantly. Yeah, I feel relief as you're talking <laughs> about that because having relocated quite a few times, I've dealt with big stacks of papers and it's just about to change completely. So that's great news for us. Sarah, any technology that you'd love to talk about? Uh, yes, uh, so everyone's talking about like when COVID hit, like the, the word that we started using for video conferencing is Zoom, <laughs> um, which, is, which is great. Uh, Zoom's great, uh, but the software that we use is one I want to mention. Uh, we know the founder; he's a great guy. His name's we just call him Flo. <laughs> he's a French founder. It's called Team Flo. Uh, it's a virtual office, and um, 
Uh, I think this is this software has greatly contributed to how cohesive our culture is as a remote team. Mm -hmm. um, it wants to emulate the physical space, but online. So it's a bird's eye view of an office, um, and you know you choose an avatar, and then you can walk walk around. Uh, and then when you get close to someone, there's like a circle around your avatar. When you get close, then the, the, you can see their camera, and they can see yours, and you can hear each other. Mm -hmm. uh, this way, you can get to see everyone else that's at work, and um, uh, you get this like feeling of, of uh, being in an office, mm -hmm. uh, emulated. And I've never worked at a, any company with as a cohesive culture as we have in Safety Wing. Um, and uh, I think that's much thanks to team flow. So that's like a plug for a technology that's essential to us that a lot of people haven't heard of. Yes, wonderful, team flow, yeah. I'm looking forward to the day where in virtual reality we can have our own like crazy futuristic sci-fi TTI office uh, and uh, you know, complement it to, to our setup. I think VR headsets are coming at us faster uh, than you know, in the last few years or so. I guess that we could cover a lot of questions more, but I just want to start opening this for any questions that you have in the audience. Um, there is no silly or enlightened question. So anyone who wants to ask something to our amazing panel, yes. Oh, yeah. the mic microphone. Check, check, check. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question because myself, I consider myself as a digital nomad and why I also think it's great to, to travel and to be free to work from where I want. Uh, I also uh, have some concern because some places I've been and some places that are popular among digital nomads more and more, uh, I feel like it's maybe not for the best of the local place. Like for example, uh, I've been in Lisbon, I've been in, but even even here in Tallinn, I sort of feel a bit like that now. So I don't know what's your point about being able to travel everywhere and work from everywhere, but what it involves from the from the locals and from the the country's economy and things like that. Yeah, that, that's all. Thank you. Hard. Thank you for the question. I would love to answer that. So first of all, uh, and I think this is, I, I would look at it actually the other way around. Uh, the economist uh, Enrico Moretti has actually found uh, basically a connection that every highly skilled job creates five jobs in the community. And very similarly, if you look at the digital nomad community, it's mainly highly skilled people. So the, the brains, the, the, uh, the money that uh, those people bring in actually help to create, on one hand, create uh, new jobs by just that contribution. On the other hand, it's the same talk we talked about Silicon Valley, like all of us kind of started from that Silicon <laughs> Valley vibe. Like if, if you would have been here 10 years ago, I, I promise you this was a completely different city. Like, the vibe that you're feeling today has been brought in by a lot of this international crowd who brought the Silicon Valley vibe, the London vibe, and now poor Silicon Valley is losing all that vibe, right? But uh, so I would encourage to look at it completely the opposite. This by being open to such movement, the countries actually can attract more talent and in grow their economy. So it's good for Lisbon. I mean, they have to fix their immigration process, though. We can talk about that separately, but uh, it's good for Lisbon. Amazing, thank you. Other questions, guys? Yes. Someone, first. someone can get the mic from? Ladies first. <laughs> All right, <laughs> perfect. Hi, I'm Kirsi from International Fox Agency. We also operate within global mobility and international recruitment. And um, I, uh, Meli directed to you, uh, Karoli, uh, about um, how to get the, Im the, the immigration officials or the, the officials <laughs> related to global mobility, uh, the employers and then the talent all in the same table so that everybody can understand one another. Since you go around speaking about this topic, maybe you have some idea about this. Thank you. Yes, I have actually gone to Finland also to speak about uh, this topic with your government. So I, I think the good news is uh, that there's, there's, a, there's a lot of pressure from the private sector side and public sector 
and the governments have to start moving. Like, I think it's what we're seeing in many of the countries. If you look at France, I mean, who usually wasn't very fast at being innovative, but right now, uh, French tech visa has been amazing. I think the way they did it, brilliant. So it is a lot of conversations, but those conversations, what I'm seeing from my end, and we are having those conversations all over the world, right, is that they are becoming easier and easier because everybody sees the same numbers. And the numbers are that by 2030, uh, the talent shortage will cost 8.5 trillion, that's 12 zeros, uh, dollars for the governments um, and for the companies. And just countries like Brazil, Japan, Indonesia will alone be missing 18 million people just to stay on the same level. This is a lot of people. So those numbers, we talk about those numbers, but the governments are seeing as well. So I, I'm an optimist, I always see a, a glass half full, that right now those discussions are becoming easier and easier. And I think we will see some bolder countries. Estonia is bold very often, but Estonia is tiny. We need some bigger, bolder countries who will make the change and those conversations will become even more easier for all of us. Thank you. I think that we are at time. One second to go. All right. There's so let's, many let's more do things. One more question. Let's do one, one more, more question, question, but a quick answer. Amazing. We'll honor quick, the man. Please quick on go and ahead. Hi. Uh, Tim Lai from Forbes, writing about digital nomad visas as well. So you, I, I can't remember which one of you mentioned you had a global passport idea or global citizenship. Yeah. What is your ultimate aim for this global citizenship? And let's say, how does it re uh, mix in with the real world of governments which are not digital nomad savvy? Yeah, um, so, uh, uh, you know, it could be a fantasy or you can choose to collaborate with existing governments. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, how, how this came about, uh, so like I said, we're building a global social safety net and um, uh, th that's kind of like the primary thing that you're a social safety net is a primary thing they're given from your country. Like that's kind of like, it's not voluntary, but you have this membership and that's what you get back. Uh, so when we're building a global social safety net, we had this thought that, you know, that is a country on the internet. Uh, you know, that, that, is some, that membership is essentially a citizenship. Um, and, uh, but it's a voluntary citizenship. Uh, how we are working on getting there um, is uh, through, you know, you have multiple routes, uh, but through collaborating with multiple governments, uh, creating visas, um, and we have multiple alternatives for how to actually get to the passport, whether you uh, get some physical land, but the primary one is probably to collaborate with uh, an existing passport that is that is future forward. Um, and uh, the idea is to make it easier to cross borders. Uh, you, you have in some way um, been able to get this citizenship and it, says some, it actually says something about who you are, uh, which will then allow other countries to be, say, welcome. Uh, but right now there's this, you know, you, you have this thing where I think GDP is one of the main drivers for uh, how good your passport is uh, because uh, wealthier countries are worried about people coming from poorer countries and taking advantage of the systems that they can have, that they have, and uh, for that to offset uh, the economy in that country. Uh, but in the future, when your citizenship actually says something about uh, who you are and um, uh, what, what you're going to contribute, uh, it's a different situation. So that's what we're working towards and creating this, this essentially a citizenship as a subscription. Um, and uh, yeah, g give it a few years and we'll be there. All right, thank you so much. Well guys, please join me in thanking our amazing panel today. Thank you so much, it's such an exciting topic. We could talk about it for hours, but thank you both of you thank so much. You.